Welcome to the show, everyone. We are talking about the nature of reality. Is our universe a virtual reality, something akin to a video game? Is consciousness the fundamental aspect of all that exists? Tom Campbell is with me. He's a scientist and a physicist, wrote a book, My Big Toe, uh, in which he talks about experiences that he's had that leads him to believe that we live in a virtual reality. And he says that his simulated uh, reality theory is backed by science and that we can logically conclude that we live in a computer simulation. He's here to talk with us about this today. And I hope, Tom, that I... I can manage some questions that you haven't already fielded a million times here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. And also, guys, there's a timestamp in the description box below that covers all of the topics that we talk about herein. Tom, thanks for joining me. These ideas are very important to me, as they are for you. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing just fine, John. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I think we're going to have a very good session. Start us out with some background here, maybe a little bit about where you went to school, what you studied, what happened with Bob Monroe, and what brought you to ultimately write My Big Toe. All right. Let me try to make this short. Um, if, you want, if you want more, you can always come back and ask for more, but I'm going to try to keep it short. And that is, I'm a physicist, you know, graduate school, master's degree, worked on PhD, uh, did not get the PhD. I left long into the PhD work. I had already passed my qualifiers. I passed all the tests. I'd done everything I needed to do. And I did the research and I finished the research paper and put it into publishable form and so on. So I basically did the PhD thing, but then I had to leave the, the university. It was just, I had to go. And I started my career as a physicist. I discovered that I could use my mind to find errors in my code that I was writing when I was a grad, this is when I was a graduate student. That opened up a whole new reality for me. I'm a scientist and I found suddenly this ability. It just happened in a, in a, in a meditation that I was doing. So that changed my mind. I, you know, I'm a scientist, so I want to model reality. And now I found there was this part of reality that was connected to my consciousness, my mind, my intent, that didn't have any material basis for it. So for me as a physicist, that just opened up another whole piece of reality that I wanted to understand, wanted to model. Uh, to skip a bunch of steps, uh, I... Um, found out that Bob Monroe was not that far away from me. Bob Monroe is author of, of uh, Journeys Out of the Body, uh, Far Journeys and Ultimate Journey. He was a man that just had out-of-bodies happen to him. He didn't want them. He was terrified when they first happened. He tried to make them stop. He went to a psychiatrist for help, but they just happened anyway. So he gave in and said, well, I'll just journal them and you know see What's going on? Well, that journal of his turned out to be his book, Journeys Out of the Body. And it was basically just a diary, a journal. This is what, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. This is what I, you know, smelled and felt. And he didn't try to say this is right or this is wrong or why or any theory behind it. It just was his experience. So I got a chance to go meet Bob and Roe. And when I did, I was wondering is this guy just making it up, wanting to sell a lot of books, or is he real? And if he's real, is he kind of goofy? You know, is he spacey? Is or just what? So I went out to meet him, and he was really solid guy. He was intelligent. He was straightforward. He was not an engineer, but he had the personality of an engineer. You know, very focused, very uh, rational, and and logical. And he had just built a lab to study consciousness. And he didn't really know what to do with that lab just yet. He knew he had to do that. He wanted to study consciousness because he wanted to put this phenomena that he had experienced. And he had convinced himself that it wasn't just his imagination because he could gather information. He could do things. He could make connections 
that that were evidential that he couldn't have done. You know, so it wasn't just that he had a had a lot of nightmares, <laughs> you know, and a lot of dreams, but he had a lot of things that were evidential. So when you get evidential material like that, then you want to study it. You want to see, you know, what is it? What's going on? What's happening here? So he built this yeah. lab, and I got there right at the beginning and joined him with the idea that if he would teach me to experience the kind of things he experienced, that then I would work for free. I'd come out and be a physicist working in his lab. So that was kind of the deal that was made. Well, that worked out very well for me. Now, my attitude going in was if this turned out to be a lot of hocus pocus and not really science, I mean, I wanted to do science because I had had this thing with my mind being able to debug software. And I knew there was some other parts of reality that weren't just physical, weren't material. They were mental. They were consciousness based somehow. But I didn't understand them and I have any idea, you know, why they worked. Why me? Why did it work for me? You know, uh, why did it work for Bob? So I was uh, starting at ground zero and Bob was too, for that matter. He didn't really understand what had happened to him either. So myself and, and uh, a friend of mine, Dennis Menrick, we both worked in technical intelligence at the time. Uh, we started to go out and talk to Bob and Bob started to teach us. And we started to do experiments. We did all sorts of experiments. One of them turned out very well, which is we were trying to help other people experience the same things. And we found this, this idea of binaural beats. And a binaural beat is a technology that helps entrain brainwaves. So if you put a person up on an, an EEG, put all the electrodes all over their head and look at the EEG, and then if they listen to binaural beats, whatever that beat frequency is, the their their EEG energy, you know, it's it's basically energy, you know, frequency and how much energy in that frequency. Typical EEG is spread over a lot of frequencies, but what it would find is that more of the energy would start to accumulate in that frequency that was equal to the beat frequency in the binaural beats. So they called that brainwave entrainment, and that was a technology we played with a whole lot in trying to get naive subjects to see what they got out of this. We, we wanted to get past the idea of belief, you know, that sort of thing. We, we mostly used naive subjects that had no idea what was going on and got them to, to uh, go through some experiments with us. So they were, so they didn't have any preconceived notions or anything what was going on. So we used the binaural beats and, and I did also a lot of research in the non-physical because after a while, Bob taught me how to experience the things he experienced. And I did experience those sorts of things and I could do it when I wanted to and I could repeat it. In other words, I could get right back to that same altered state of consciousness very precisely. So, and that allowed me to actually do science there. In other words, hmm. we were doing things that were evidential. We were, uh, you know, doing remote viewing. You know, what is at a certain place in the world? Or what, here's a number I'm going to put on the blackboard after you guys get locked into your, you know, isolation booths. Uh, you know, what's that number? So we did just lots of things that would be evidential. And both Dennis and I, after, you know, three or four years working with Bob and Roe, had done hundreds, probably thousands of things that were very ev evidential. Something real was going on. It wasn't just we were having, you know, nice daydreams in the, in the lab. So I started going into these states where I was doing things that were evidential and changing, say, one parameter. So you change it and then see how that changed the result. Did that change the evidence? Did that change the results of what was going on? Did it make it easier or harder to collect that evidence or to have that effect that we were trying to have? And then I changed it a little more, a little more, and then I'd hold that constant and change another variable and so on. That took a long time. So that was about 35 years worth. I wasn't all at the lab with Bob Monroe. The first decade was about Bob Monroe, but it was 35 years worth of basically using my consciousness as a, as a lab to study 
consciousness to study what could it do? What couldn't it do? To try to discern why couldn't it do it, you know, or why it could. What were the parameters? Um, what made a difference? What allows you to be effective at collecting evidence that you were doing something that was evidential, you know, real, not just something that could be in your imagination. So I did that for a long time. And after about 35 years of that research, I thought I had enough together to write a book. And of course, okay. that's the My Big Toe books that you just held up and, and read. So that's basically, it took me about five years to write. And that's basically a, a summary of what I had learned through all of this trial and error, basically, uh, work inside of consciousness. And what happened is that, you know, in all that time, of course, I was working as a professional physicist, uh, okay. a, an applied physicist at the same time. So I kind of had dual careers going here. I had a, my day job, which was in physics, and my night job, which was in consciousness research. So that went on for a long, long time. And I, what I did is I had a bunch of facts, things that I had determined from my own experience were facts of consciousness. And of course, I had a, a set of facts about the material reality. As a physicist, you know, I had those facts as well. So then I started looking for one overarching understanding that would derive both sets of facts. Not just support both sets of facts, but derive both sets of facts so that you could understand why you know, the physical world was the way it was, its limitations, its mysteries, why the conscious world was the way it was. So it, I was looking for this overall theory, if you will, or understanding is maybe the best, or model is, a, is probably the better word. I was looking for a model that would explain everything, you know, the proverbial toe that uh, scientists yeah. look for. But this was not a little toe. A little toe is the one Einstein uh, was working on, and that was to make relativity and quantum mechanics to find what was the superset of that, because those two were both successful, but each one had had a kind of a philosophical concept that the other one denied. You know, they, they're not really entirely compatible with their view of reality. So the scientists at the time realized that there's something else, some other bigger understanding that you should be able to then derive both of those from. So you had two right. separate things, and two separate things are fine, but they each work just in their own area, which means there's something bigger yet atop of those in the hierarchy of understanding reality. And that's what Einstein called a toe, a theory of everything. But just unifying quantum mechanics and relativity, I call that just a little toe, because that's just kind of an overview, an over theory of the material world. Whereas I was looking for an overview of everything, including consciousness. So I come up with this idea and this theory, and then I publish the books, which are pretty much theory of consciousness in, in the books. And then I realized a couple of years after I'd published the books, this is 2003, that, oh, this is how quantum physics works. I got it. And then, oh, this is why the speed of light's a constant. Well, those two things basically define all of modern physics. You know, that's how we do physics these days. It's relativity and quantum mechanics. Those are the things. Uh, classical mechanics, Newtonian physics, is just a subset of the quantum physics and of relativity, too. So the, the classical physics just works in a space where things don't go too fast and they're not too small. You know, yeah. And but it's just that subset. So it's not the it's not the general model. So anyway, when I understood why quantum physics worked the way it did, quantum physics wasn't weird physics anymore. It was rational physics. And you take the old line that Feynman said that says just shut up and calculate. Or he also said, uh, we'll never understand in the, in the normal way of the word understand, you know, how quantum physics works. It's just something that nature is not going to reveal to us. And those things were just wrong. You don't have to shut up and calculate. You can look at the logic and tell what the result's going to be once you understand how it really works. So 
I started looking at other um, mysteries, okay, that are in physics. So we call these paradoxes in physics. And there's a bunch of paradoxes in physics, lots of paradoxes in physics, things that just don't make sense from a, from a, a materialist viewpoint. For the most part, they don't make sense. Uh, one of those things is uh, where did that ball of plasma come from that was the Big Bang? We know if we start with that ball of plasma, we can evolve all the rest of the universe. But where did that ball of plasma come from? didn't come from this reality because that's reality hadn't existed yet. It didn't exist until that ball of plasma, you know, expanded and created the, the suns and planets and so on. Oh, and then there's lots of smaller uh, uh, paradoxes, like where does time come from? Where does charge come from? Where does space come from? You know, where does mass come from? Physics really has no idea about those things. You ask physicists about all the basic things in physics. You know, physics is just the interrelation of all those things. Time, space, mass, charge, spin. You know, there's, these are the basic quantities. And science has no idea where any of those things originated. How, do they, how did they come to exist? They just are. Science says they just are because they are. They're, they're a given we start with them. Well, that's not very scientific. They just are because they are. You know, you'd like to understand them better. And this, this overall theory of mine, which then I called my big toe because it was a big picture yeah. theory, uh, that answered all those questions. Why the speed of light is a constant. You know, all, everything else, the speeds add. You know, the velocities add. If you're in a car going 10 mile an hour and you reach out and you throw a baseball another 10 mile an hour in the forward direction of the car, the baseball is going 20 mile an hour relative to the yeah. ground. Well, it's not like that with light. You take a light, a flashlight, and let it go, you know, half the speed of light and turn on the flashlight, and the light that comes out of that flashlight is still going just the speed of light. It's not going yeah. one and a half times the speed of light. So it's, a, it's an odd thing. And we have odd things like, Photons. Photons are particles, right? Yes, but what's their mass? Well, they have zero rest mass, but they have mass, which is really energy because, you know, the equivalence of mass and energy. So that's kind of an unusual sort of thing. What do you mean you have a thing that has zero rest mass? What does that really mean? You know, so we're getting, you know, it's kind of, uh, that's not Newton's science that's not that's not newton's physics you see physics let is me getting weird. make sure that that i that i'm that i'm with you here so okay. you go to school you study physics uh you major in physics you get out of school you work in physics you meet up with bob monroe who is someone who started having these experiences kind of just unexpectedly and he was trying mm -hmm. to understand what was happening to him so he sets up a research center you come there, some other people come there, you do studies for years at this place. And over the years, you kind of come to these certain realizations, you know, this is a fact about reality, this is a fact, and you accumulate enough of these facts, and it leads you to write a book uh, called My Big Toe. And, and we'll get into some of the specifics with the speed of light, and you know, the pixelation mm -hmm. of reality and whatnot. But let's, let's, let's talk about consciousness for a moment. When you write this book, what kind of conclusions do you draw about consciousness? I think that'll open us up to some of these questions that I have for you here. Okay. Well, I come to the realization, and it was actually during the process of writing the book, because I was, once I found out that I started writing the book, I realized I had a lot of ideas that were kind of fuzzy. You know, they, were, they were kind of foggy ideas. I thought I understood them, but when you have to actually write something down, it mm. forces you to clarity. And there's lots of ideas. You know, we normally don't mind fuzzy thoughts. We don't even know the thoughts are fuzzy. We think we just understand something. But when yeah. you have to sit down and write it down, then suddenly, the you know, you realize that uh, it's not all that clear. So it took me. No, a while that's to so come. very true. And I want to jump in here because I just finished a book called "The Power of Writing It Down." And what you said <laughs> is so true about clarity and if you have yeah. to write something down you actually have to think it through which will lead you to more realizations but exactly. uh, that was just a, a great point that's such a true yeah. point about reading but go on with uh, the okay, book so as i was writing this book you know it became clearer and clearer to me that consciousness 
was about information. It was all about information. And that was, you know, I mean, if I, if I bring that up now, it's rather obvious. What are you conscious of? Well, what you're conscious of is, and you can describe that with information. So consciousness is, is awareness. What are you aware of? Well, that can be described with information. So consciousness is an information system. Okay, consciousness is a, is a system. Now, I learned, one of the facts I learned is that doing this research is that consciousness is fundamental. And I got that point because I could be, I could work from consciousness, just from mind, from consciousness, and I could affect things here in this reality. But I could not do the opposite. I could not start from here and change anything that was fundamental in consciousness. So the arrow of causality always went from consciousness to the physical world. And what Can that tells you. Can you maybe tells... give us an example of, of that? Just to make sure that I'm fully understanding your concept there with how you can affect the world with your mind, but it doesn't work in the reverse. Okay. Well, you can affect the world with your mind, and you can do that in many ways. Part of the ways that the consciousness works is that your intent can modify the future probability. Okay. Now, that probably right. doesn't make any sense to people yet because we haven't discussed that, but this world is also information based, and it's not a bottoms up simulation. You know, it's not really we start with particles and build up bigger particles and bigger particles until we finally get to, to um, uh, molecules and then we get to the physical world. We, it's not that. It's more of a top down done in probability. It's that sort of a model. So when you do a bottoms up, you know what's going to happen next because you've worked all the things that are in motion. What's going to happen next is that motion's just going to move a little bit, right? When you work from the top down, how do you know what's going to happen next? You see, you're, you're, not, you're not building it. You're just describing it. So when you, have, when you go from the top down in probability, we have this, I have found, you know, this is one of the things I discovered, is that the way the system knows what to render next is it takes a probability distribution of the possibilities, and it takes a random draw from that probability distribution. Now, a random draw doesn't just randomly take one out of the possibilities. It's a random draw from a probability distribution. So the things that are more probable are more likely to come out in that random draw. Okay, so that's how it knows what's going to happen next. So everything that happens next is always possible because it's taken from a random draw from a distribution of the possibilities. But some things are obviously more likely than others. And sometimes that's a zero and one. You know, it's, it's obvious. Only this can happen. But often there's many things that can happen. And we can modify those probabilities with our intent. That's what I meant by, you know. So now I just skipped about 10 steps, you know, and launched into something else. But uh, just kind of pretend that that might be true for a while. Okay. And because we can modify future probability, we can actually have an influence on the things that happen here. Because what happens here is drawn from that random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. So I can affect it. That's how people use their minds to heal. You've heard no doubt of you know, people using their intentions in their minds to heal. Well, that's a real thing. You can do that. Um, that's a thing that you have to do many, many times and keep statistics on. Like almost all of medical science, you have to look at the probabilities. You know, you can't say, oh, here's a pill, and this pill cures headaches. And you give it to somebody, and their headache goes away, and you say, ah, proof. That's not proof. <laughs> their headache might have gone away anyway. You got to give it to 10,000 people, right, under all sorts of conditions with a, with a, a, a good sample and, and so on. And then you can maybe say, ah, this, has, this is significant. Here's evidence, you see. So the evidence comes in the probability. So I did a lot of those sorts of things. We're using intent. I did remote viewing where I would see things that otherwise I had, would have no way of knowing, you know, what was there. Numbers on boards, uh, places on maps, so things, places I'd never been and things I wouldn't know about. And they were accurate, but not always accurate. 
So now you have to understand, well, why aren't they always accurate? <laughs> Here in the physical world, you either see a brick or you don't see a brick. You know, it's not like, well, I think I see a brick. But in the, in the, the uh, world of intuition and in the world of consciousness, it's about probability. It's not, it's not the same. You know, it's not like you just take this physical world and move it into another space. It's not like that at all. It's a totally different thing, this, this concept of consciousness. So I was able to affect things, to remote view, to come up with information about maybe other people that I could check and see if it was true and so on. And I could do that with consciousness, but there wasn't anything that I could do here that really affected consciousness. And you say, well, of course you can, you know, somebody hits you over the head with an iron pipe and that affects your consciousness. No, what it does is it, it sets more constraints on what consciousness can do with that body, with that avatar. Okay. So it's not that it affects consciousness. It just mm. constrains consciousness, or you can do things that lifts constraints. Let's consciousness maybe do more things with that body. Uh, so it just changes the constraints that the conscious has to work with. It doesn't actually change consciousness. So that was a conclusion I came through. And I'm just giving you just tips of the iceberg. You know, I'm talking sure. now about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of experiments that I did over time trying to determine, you know, about what people experienced and what they did, people who were hurt, people had brain injuries, people who were comatose, and how was their consciousness affected by that? Well, how did I know that? Because eventually, you all consciousness, you see, is connected. Every consciousness is in a, a big net, if you will, just like the, the World Wide Web, where all the websites are on this big net, and any mm -hmm. website can be connect, you know, can be gotten to from any other website. Well, consciousness is like that. Every conscious, every conscious entity has a potential connection to every other conscious entity. So that person who was comatose or that person with the head injury, you could actually connect with them consciousness to consciousness and see what was going on. Now, yes, all of this is subjective. Okay, All of the things that are what we'll call paranormal, that are not explained with... with uh, materialistic, you know, viewpoint, all of these things that are paranormal all happen on the intuitive side. They don't happen on the intellectual side. Consciousness has two ways of processing information. One is intellectual, that uses logic. The other one is intuitive, that doesn't use logic. It uses something else. It's beyond logic, it's intuitive, but it's still real. Now, Almost anything that we do very, very well, we have to do intuitively. There's very little that we do intellectually very, very well. Now, there's some exceptions to that, but let's just take the, the most obvious one is touch typing. When you touch type, if you use your intellect, oh, where's the T? Oh, okay, there it is, top row, you know, right there. Where's the E? Well, you're never going to type very well if you do that, if your intellect mm -hmm. is, is looking at the keys. You have to get to the point where it's intuitive where you don't think where is that. Your finger just knows where it is without logic, without thinking. Mm -hmm. So a touch typist can be a really good typist. Any athlete who's at the top of their game, like Olympic class athletes, will tell you that you know, whether they win or lose is mostly their mental. Everybody's trained. Everybody's fit. You know, <laughs> Everybody's good at what they're doing. But yeah. winning is mental. You have to have the right mindset. And that's all intuitive so that's just two different ways that the mind works there is a intuitive side to it and all the paranormal stuff is over on the intuitive side and that is not objective that's entirely subjective so that's one thing about my big toe my theory of everything is that it describes and explains everything subjective as well as everything objective now, another point I'd like to make that uh, it'd be important for your readers is I have this theory of everything, this big, big picture theory of everything. It's not to say that this is what I think must be true. It's not that this is what I believe. This is a model. I'm a scientist. This is a model. 
So I've made a model of reality that says, you know, I have a couple of assumptions. One is that consciousness exists. Another was that uh, uh, evolution exists. That's it. After that, I logically describe this model. Now, what makes a model valuable isn't whether the majority of people like it, you know, or whether they don't. What makes a, a model valuable is what can it explain? Okay, now there's a bunch of facts that are called experimental facts. These are the things that experiments show these are true. These things happen. Experimental facts. Now, remote viewing is one of those experimental facts. And you have to be really blind, you know, to not be able to find that that's a fact. There are plenty of people who remote view and are very good at it. You know, so if that's a fact, then there needs to be an explanation for it. There are people who have precognitive dreams. That's a fact, you know, and how does that happen? Why is it? Is it just luck, just dumb luck that they do that? Well, there are people who can, you know, help the law enforcement find criminals and, you know, find mm -hmm. things like that. You know, these are things that, that I've done. And they're facts enough that, of course, we had people uh, that were helping the CIA find out, you know, facts. And that was a very successful program, even though it's, it, it either is still a successful program that nobody's talking about or it's been ended. You know, it's hard to say. You'd have to have the right clearances to decide which one of those it was. But in any case, these are facts. So you need to deal with them as facts. So my model basically can explain all of the, the um, subjective side. Now, that means it has to also explain to people like, why are you unhappy? Why are you struggling with life? You know, so all of those things are subjective. Um, you know, what is love? All that's subjective. Um, so it has to be able to explain all those things and explain them logically. So that's kind of the model. But no, this is not Tom Campbell's belief of the way he thinks the world is. This is a model that I've constructed based on my research and the data I've done. And it explains all of the physics. It explains all of the um, objective world better than the current physics does because it explains quantum physics and relativity and solves a whole bunch of paradoxes and it explains the subjective world better than we have now too so it's just better science and eventually this will become kind of well known i think in a in a in a, a, a dominant viewpoint of reality because it just is better science and Given time, better science rises to the top. You know, it, it always does. Even if it takes, you know, a century to do that, it, it does. So this is not my belief. This is, you know, a model. Judge the model solely by what can it explain and how many assumptions, you know, what kind of contrivances does it need to explain it? So you need to have, you need to explain, like Einstein said, the, the point of all science is to, explain as much as possible with as few assumptions as possible. So you come to this point where after doing experiments and looking at, you know, physics results and whatnot, that you come to think that we're in an actual computer simulation, that this is all some kind of program running out and we're simply avatars akin to what we would, you know, think of as mm -hmm. a computer. What specifically led you to think that this is a literal simulated reality and how how influential are the double slit experiment and the quantum eraser experiments? How do they play into your whole idea about the simulated uh, okay. reality? Okay. Well, the logic went something like this, a realization that consciousness is an information system, a realization. And this is, again, a, a fact of mine. When I call it a fact of mine, let me let me point out that if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. These things that I'm saying are my truth because they're based on my experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect them to be your truth or anybody else's truth unless you experience them. But you can experience them. And we can talk about that, that later. But in yeah. any case, so we have um, in, uh, consciousness is an information system. Consciousness is fundamental. Those were two, two things that are my truths. If it's fundamental, that means everything else is derived thereof, you know, so it's the source. So then how do 
you know, how does bricks and elephants and, you know, garbage trucks and all the material world, you know, how does all that stuff get derived out of consciousness? That's kind of a bizarre, uh, you know, bizarre thing. Well, you also realize that consciousness not only is, is fundamental, but it is the fundamental substrate for everything. It is the fundamental source, if you will. Now, I call it the larger consciousness system, but that's just a metaphor for source. It's the thing at the root, at the bottom, the foundation of everything else. And I found that the way I could change things and manipulate things in the physical world, like I was saying with mind, I realized that mind, that the physical world is, is derived. Well, that's easy to see, okay? We have quantum physics and, and uh, particle scientists, particle physicists telling us that reality is information-based. And if you go to any physics department and look up the quantum theorists and the particle physicists, they'll all tell you that, yes, reality is information-based. It's not physical-based. It's not matter-based. They can't model an electron as a chunk of matter with a chunk of mass with charge. They can't get the right answer with that. It doesn't work. That's not reality. They have to model an electron as a point with the attributes of mass and the attributes of charge, which is the way you would simulate an electron. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, that's how they can use their quantum physics to calculate what happens when atom smashers over in Geneva, you know, blow things apart and get lots of particles out and energy out. They have to model it as point with attributes, not as little chunks of mass. So the, the scientists today, modern scientists, I think are pretty much in agreement that our reality is information based, but they don't know what to do with that. They don't know what the next step is. They don't know how to, you know, they don't know how to write that down in an equation. They don't know how to put that in any way that's coherent. So they're just stuck there and they just say that. They're not necessarily going to say it's a virtual reality, but they, because they don't necessarily want to go there. Yeah. But they'll say it's information based. So when I put all that together and I understood this thing about um, the way the, the system works is it's probabilistic. Well, quantum physics tells us that too. Particles are only potential particles. They're only metaparticles until the measurement's made. And then that magic happens when the wave function, that's a probability wave, function collapses to a physical measurement. Well, that sounds kind of mystical to me. The wave mm -hmm. function collapses to a physical particle, and there are no physical particles until that happens. The particles yeah. are all just uh, protoparticles someplace, potential particles. Mm -hmm. Well, that's telling you something about our reality. So quantum physics gives us you know, delayed erasure you know, is another one of those things. Whereas you already have the particles have made their imprint on the screen. And afterwards, delayed, that's what the delayed mean. After that happens, you change something. And you find out that what's on the screen will then turn out to support what you changed it to. And it looks like it's gone back in time and rearranged itself. Well, yes. it doesn't do that. It doesn't go back in time and rearrange itself. It just looks like that when you don't understand what's going on. So anyway, kind of getting off the off the subject here. But but this is a this is a model that then explains all that stuff. The larger consciousness system is the source system. It works on probability. Quantum physics tells us that probability is at the core of this. Not, not matter. And after that, it's easy to realize that, one, we are conscious. We are consciousness. So John Michael is consciousness. He's a piece mm -hmm. of consciousness. And what is this physical body? Well, consciousness can manipulate the physical. So what is this physical body? The physical body is the avatar. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at games. You know, simulated games, simulated realities like World of Warcraft, like The Sims, those sorts of things. Yeah. And you look at how it is they're structured. They're structured. They have a 
a program, right, is written. That simulate that program is written, and the computer takes that program and it calculates everything that's going on. Now, those things are all in 3D. You know, they're not just stick figures walking around in 2D. They were in the beginning, like uh, what was it? Uh, you know, some of the early 60s and 70s, you know, games were right. all were all just 2D. But eventually, you get perspective, you get 3D, you get you get all of that's going on. So, what's happening there is that. From the, if we make a, if, if we make an analogy between us and the computer game, if you look at the, at the elf that's in World of Warcraft, that elf mm -hmm. <clears throat> cannot find the server that's serving the program. That elf can't find it because that server has to be outside of that virtual reality. The elf can only run around inside the virtual reality. So the computer has to be non-physical from the elf's viewpoint, all right? Now, also, from the elf's viewpoint, the player has to be non-physical, too. That's the player is the one that makes all the choices for the elf. What's yeah. the elf? The elf is just some eye candy that lets us keep track of what's going on, you know, something that we mm -hmm. can look at. It's just a lot of bits on a, on a video screen. Is all it is. It's computed. It's not a real thing. It's just a computed thing. So it has these these three things going on. There's the player that makes all the choices. There's the server, or the computer, that serves up the virtual reality game. And then there's the game itself, which has the elf and all the players in it. So there's only two of those things are actually real. And that's the server and the player. And the server and player are in this dance of sending information back and forth, right? So the player says, I want, to, I want my player to run away, run away quick. And he sends that to the server. The server then shows the player running away quick and has to calculate what that means. What are the consequences of running away quick? That's part of the rule set of the game that defines the world of Warcraft. You say, so now when we look at that from us, all right, if that's a virtual reality game, then what does that say about us? That says our body is the avatar. It's just eye candy. Our body is the <clears throat> avatar and that our consciousness is the player making all the choices for the avatar and that the player and the computer are all part of the same thing because just like the player and the computer all have to be in the same reality in a video game because they're communicating with each other back and forth all the time. Well, we, the consciousness player, have to be in the same reality and of the same stuff as the computer, the server, which is consciousness. Consciousness is an information system. An information system can configure itself in the form of a computer, a server. It can also organize itself in terms of a consciousness, an individuated unit of consciousness that's a player. So now the computer and the player are both different organizations, different subsets of the fundamental source stuff, which is consciousness. So that's kind of how I looked at it. And all that just kind of fell into place once I got this idea that consciousness was information. It was all about information, information systems. And that got to, and all that works out. And then I started realizing that, oh, I can take that and I can understand quantum physics. I can understand, you know, the speed of light, why it's a constant. These sorts of things all start coming out of that understanding. And then I started working on other things. Where does time come from? Where does, um, you know, mass and charge and where are all these in space? Where do they come from? And suddenly, click, click, click. I had answers for all of those. Where did that ball of plasma come from? Ah, there's the answer. And how is it? And somebody would say, well, who programmed it then? If this is a virtual reality, who's the programmer? Is that God's the yeah. programmer? No, there is no programmer. It evolved. This is where evolution comes in. It just evolved. And we today in our computer science departments and universities do a similar thing. You take a rule set and a set of initial conditions and you let it evolve. And those initial conditions will change according to the rule set. And you can evolve things. Well, we had a set of initial conditions. That was that ball of plasma, the initial conditions. You know, very 
very small space, very high pressure, very high temperature, you know, and we have a rule set we call science, physics even. That's the rule set. So you start with a ball of plasma, you come up with a rule set, and you push the run button, and you let that ball of plasma change according to the rule set. And it evolves, and it evolves into planets and stars and, you know, the universe and yada, yada, you know, and here we are. So we have now, we are this avatar. So it evolved us as avatars. It evolved our biology out of a rule set and a set of initial conditions. And that gave consciousness a play, a, a, something that could play. Now the players had a game they could play in. And why was that important? Because the whole point of an information system is to create more and better information. And we can call that lowering its entropy. This is a very central core idea here. So you have an information system. and if Let all me the go back j just to ask one question about, about the Big Bang before we go into entropy. Okay. Um, when it comes to that Big Bang, there were some inputs there that evolved over a long period of time. Right. I guess I guess the obvious question for someone that doesn't know any better but would be where did those inputs come from? Right. Well, that's a good question and that's one that's one of those uh, paradoxes that we have here in physics. In physics we have this paradox. I think it's a uh, I, I'm not sure the proper name for it, but what what it is is that there are a set of constants that if the you know kind of universal constants constants at the universe level and if these constants were different like gravitation is one of those constants yeah. so sure. if you have these constants and if they change even in the ninth or tenth decimal place the whole universe wouldn't have evolved it would have crashed and burned it, it, you know it would go unstable you know everything mm -hmm. has to be balanced you know in a in a simulation like this, there's lots of things that just have to balance to end up with what we've got. So here we have this, I think it's the anthropomorphic principle or something like that is what it's called. But anyway, so we have this set of constants. And if you changed any one of them in a 10th decimal place, the whole universe wouldn't exist. It would have become unstable and gone away. Well, how does that happen? Well, that's easy. Okay, big bang, take one. We've got a rule set. We've got initial conditions. It goes a little while and it crashes. All right, let's adjust. Let's turn that gravity down a little bit. Let's do this. Let's adjust that. Big bang, take two. And you keep doing that over and over, maybe thousands of times, maybe hundreds of thousands of times, trial and error, until you have this system, the rule set and the initial conditions tuned to be stable mm -hmm. over a very yeah. long period of time. That then tells us why we happen to have these constants all to, you know, to many decimal places that are so, have to be so critically accurate. Why? Because they evolved to be that way. So there's one of those paradoxes solved. Could it be though that there, there really is a literal programmer outside of our reality? Or do you think that that is probably not likely the case? No, that's not likely the case. Programming is very, very time-consuming and very, what can we say, uh, not very adaptable. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's much better to have what's now called um, procedural programming. Like, uh, I think the first big one out of the gate on that was called No Man's Sky. Okay, where in No Man's Sky, they have quintillions of planets and critters and fauna and all this stuff. And it's all computed on the fly, right? Mm -hmm. If you're there, whatever you're looking at, it computes that. And as soon as you look away, it stops computing that. It's all yeah. done with, with probability, random number generators and probability. So, yes, it's got a, a rule set behind it, but there's all sorts of different things now can evolve out of that. So if you've got even just 10 or 20 variables in a game like that, how many possibilities can you get out of mixing 10 or 20 things? You know, well, it's trillions, quadrillions. Mm -hmm. So the number of possibilities of the way things can go together are, are tremendous. So that is the way our reality is. We only, our reality is only generated in as much as what we look at. When we don't look at it, it's not, we're not getting a data stream. 
Remember, we, the player, get a data stream from the server, and that data stream defines the reality that we see. All right, so right now, I'm seeing a bookcase behind you, and I'm getting data stream, and my consciousness is getting a data stream from the server that shows me a bookcase behind you. Your data stream doesn't have a bookcase in it because it's behind you, you see? Right. So right now, you know, we think we have organs inside our body that we need oxygen to breathe, that we have lungs and we distribute, you know, hem hemoglobin gets the oxygen, distributes it around to the cells and so on. We think all that's, you know, has to happen. It doesn't have to happen. Only when you have a, something that measures that oxygen, only when you look at it. In other words, the physical world is just the surface. So you don't, ha it doesn't have to, to um, what's it called? Render, it doesn't have to render a heart or lungs or a brain or an optic nerve. All it has to render for us is what looks like as if you had a brain, as if you had a heart and lungs. So it has to render that just like the elf. The elf doesn't have lungs and a brain, but if that, if that elf goes underwater and stays too long, it drowns. Why? Lack of oxygen. Well, how's that possible? You know, that elf is just a figment. How does it die because it doesn't have enough oxygen? Well, it's just the way the rule set's written. Our rule set is a very complex rule set that we call science. We call physics. And it's allowed this physical reality to be here. But our physical reality is just rendered. Everything physical is a rendering. So we're a piece of consciousness getting a data stream from this server, this larger consciousness system that's a server, and we see it as this. Just like we see that world of Warcraft as this, you know, it's whatever we see it. There's rivers and rocks and trees and buildings and people, and the people speak to you and all of that, just like it is here. So you think that, well, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we would have said, wow, that's just too much. Computers can't be that fast. Well, now we mm -hmm. say they can. They can. You can. There's lots of visuals out there in virtual reality games that are very, very realistic. And then if they put you on a platform that, bump, you know, that bumps and, and, and moves and wiggles and, and they put in smells and they put in things, you know, spray water and do liquids, you know, if you get the really, really highest tech stuff, it's really very hard to tell that from this, you know, the virtual from the not virtual. It's really hard. So all you need is a, com <laughs> is a computer that's just about as good as our computers now. So, yeah. you know, we're talking about things that are basically billions of times faster and better than our computers are now. So the fact that it can do this is not impossible now the fact that it is not a grounds up you see people throw away the virtual reality possibility they say it's just impossible if you start with you know elementary particles you know you start mm -hmm. with those and then you take the quarks and you you make you know particles out of them and then you make atoms out of the particles and then you make molecules out of the atoms and if you if you go through that and you say and if you had to keep track of all of that it's just too much it's beyond the possibility. Computation. Yeah, the, the computation is impossible. Well, I agree with that. That's a ridiculous idea. It doesn't work that way. It works, you know, World of Warcraft doesn't th that way. That elf isn't built up of molecules. <laughs> that elf is just pixels on a screen lit up. And so are we, you see. Now, I, I have a question here. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you were talking about how realistic videos or games are becoming. I was looking at a video not long ago on YouTube and I thought I was watching like a video game recording and I looked a little closer and I realized that it was actually a real life event that was playing out. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know. I've, I've so done I that was... before. Yeah, my, my uh, grandson was, was in my house and playing a, uh, uh, a basketball. He was, he was watching mm -hmm. this basketball game and I'm walking and he's doing it and I say, well, who's playing, you know? And then you know, I, I realize he's going click, 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 click on his things. And I look at it again and, yeah. oh, yeah, that's not an actual basketball game that's being played. Right. But it looked like it. You know, now once you realize it and you study it a little bit, you, you can see little bits yeah. and details. But, you know, those can be fixed with just more 
more processor and a little and more more detail. So, yes, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. I want to ask you this. Um, you know, when it comes to these video games that have really uh, it's almost hard to believe what's become a video game since I was a child when there were just very primitive dots on a screen and, and you know, Pong and whatnot. But even as good as those things look, and even though they might trick you, if you look, you're not sure mm -hmm. if you're seeing a video, it's still only a two dimensional operation, right? It's just light on a screen, a flat screen, which is is quite different than the actual world that we're experiencing, which is an actual literal 3D reality. So I wonder how it would be possible to actually make like an, a literal 3D reality, not just one where our sense experience is kind of tricking us into thinking it is, and how you would actually cause consciousness to happen inside that reality. And, and you know, it just, I don't know. What do you think about what I just you don't, said? You don't need that 3D reality. All you need is it needs to appear to be 3D to mm -hmm. the player. If the player sees it as a 3D, then that's all you need. Anything else is not is unnecessary. I mean, what so is would you say that our reality is only two dimensional in some fundamental aspect? Then I I wouldn't say that it's only two dimensional because I don't think we can limit it to dimensions. It's just our data stream is just no more than what we need in order to function in it in order to interact okay now we can interact in a virtual reality that is basically dots on a screen because we see depth we see rivers we see trees blowing in the wind we see people you know fighting with their swords we see all this stuff going and we see it all in 3d that's mm -hmm. a 3d world and we interact with it that way we decide to run or fight or jump up and down or dance or do whatever we decide to do based on what we see and that's all you need. You don't need any more than that. So we are given enough information that what we see, we interpret that as a 3D reality. It's our interpretation as mm -hmm. consciousness. So consciousness sees a bunch of pixels on a screen. And consciousness interprets those pixels on a screen as rocks and rivers and people and trees and turtles. It just interprets them that way. All they are is dots of light on a screen. Matter of fact, they've only got what three three coordinates. They got a color, you know, they got a position, and they got an intensity. That's it. Mm -hmm. And we take that data and then we interpret it to be a 3D landscape. That's all that's necessary. And as you turn and look around and as you go other places and as you look behind things and pick up rocks and look under them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be anything that's 3D. All it has to be is data that we can interpret in terms of the 3D. And how do we learn to interpret the data that way? Well, we start when we are born and we find out, you know, this is mom, this is dad, that's an apple, this is my house, this is outside my house. And we start interpreting things. We don't know what anything is, but we learn. And we learn how to interpret and how it interacts and what it means to us. And we learn how to do that interpretation. So we get this this data stream, we interpret it to be this reality, mm -hmm. which brings us to a very interesting point. In a virtual reality, there, the virtual reality itself only exists in the minds of the players. Okay? When you're playing World of Warcraft, there is no place where there's a bunch of little elves and barbarians running around fighting each other. Yeah. It only exists in the minds of the players. Okay? So mm -hmm. if you want to put a new thing, if you want to, say, drive a Jeep through that, uh, you know, through that war that's going on, well, then that Jeep has to be in the mind of a player somewhere. The player who's looking at that space will get that data that defines that Jeep driving through there. Okay, So it only exists in the minds of the players. Now, what does that mean to us if our reality only exists in the minds of the players? What that means to us is that until we make the measurement, we don't have a real particle because a real particle only becomes real when some player gets the information. Then it becomes a part of the virtual reality. If we're calling the virtual reality the physical space, like it is to the elf, you know, versus virtual reality is a physical space. Well, until that comes to a, to a player, 
there is no particle. Mm -hmm. That data comes to that player now. And that plays into quantum mechanical decoherence and everything. That's it. That's what quantum mechanical. Well, that's the that's the uh that's why you have this thing called the you know, the what is it, the 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 observer paradox is what they call mm -hmm. it. How come it is that you only get a particle when the measurement's made? Well, the measurement is the observation. Now, whether it's a tool making the observation or a human, doesn't make any difference. It's the information becomes available to a player. And whether that information is actually looked at by the player doesn't matter either. It's just available to the player. And that's why Quantum physics works the way it works. That's why we have this magical, the wave function collapses to a physical particle when the measurement's made. And that doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's why, because nothing can come into this reality if it doesn't come in as information to a player. So the player's important. So there we've got that. What about, this, what about the, uh, the speed of light? Well, yeah. the speed of light is a constant because... That's as fast as you can move a particle, a piece of mass, from one pixel to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. So we have, a like all simulations, there's a time clock. You know, you cycle through time. That makes it a dynamic simulation. If you got motion, you have to see it's here now, and then it's there next time, it's there next time, it's there next time. Things move. That's called a dynamic situation where you have motion. Things change. Well, there has to be a time loop. So you keep increasing time by delta t. You know, every go through the time loop, re re compute everything. Now my finger's here. Next delta t, it's here. Next delta t, it's here. And if I have delta t small enough, then it looks like it's smooth. You know, it it looks like we see it. All right. So every simulation has an outside clock. So as fast as you can move something contiguously not teleporting, jumping around teleporting, but contiguously through our space is one pixel at a time. So when you move, here's this delta T, it's here. This delta T, it's the next pixel. Next delta T, it's the next pixel. You can't move any faster than that. Mm -hmm. To go faster, you'd have to skip pixels. Well, it's here. Now I'm going to yeah. jump at 10. Well, that's teleporting. And that's not the kind of virtual reality we have it we have things that move contiguously at least appear to move contiguously through space so that's why speed of light's a constant because that's as fast as you can move something through and that is means that we have a a delta t and a delta x right for that pixel size and if you take delta x divide by delta t you get the speed of light that's the fastest speed that things can go now think about this the delta t and delta x define the resolution of our virtual reality. And it's a fact that the speed of light seems to have changed a little bit out in the eighth or ninth decimal place over time. It, yeah. gets, just, it gets just a tiny bigger. It gets just a tiny less. Now, not much, just way out there in that space. And that's another big paradox. How come? And this is not measurement at Act, you know, measurement error. It's mm -hmm. changes that are bigger than the error of the measurement. So these are yeah. real changes in the speed of light. Tiny little changes. Now, why would that be? Well, if delta T and delta X represent the resolution, what if we need a little more resolution? Can we get that? Well, we just need to keep that ratio the same because we don't want the speed of light to change because there's a whole lot of things in physics that that speed of light affects rather dramatically. So mm -hmm. we're going to keep that the same. So what do we do? Well, we're going to try to change the delta T and the delta X by the same amount, right? We want them both so the ratio stays the same. So yeah. we make delta T twice as big and delta X twice as big or half as big. So we do that. Now, we can't do that exactly because we're talking about pixels so you can only change them to keep that ratio such that you know you can't change them to be anything you want you have to you they have to change by a whole delta you know by a whole pixel worth of delta t or a whole pixel worth of delta x and there so, has to be a constant of proportionality but whichever you can't way make, you go with it right but you can't make that proportion be exactly the same because you can't split pixels into pieces. Because mm -hmm. it's pixelated, you're going to get it as close as you can, but there's always going to be a little bit of misfit to it. 
because it's pixelated. You can't divide pixels. So that's another one of those mysteries that now has a, has a solution that we could do that. Now, why would they want to change resolution? Well, resolution, more resolution takes up more computation space. You shouldn't ever have more resolution in your model than you need, you know, for your, for what, whatever your users are. Well, we start digging deeper and deeper into things, then we need more and more resolution to support that. Mm -hmm. The system is not efficient if it delivers more resolution than actually the users need. So, of course, the resolution is going to change. As we dig deeper and deeper into our material reality, that's going to need more resolution. And what is that res resolution now? We call that, uh, what, Planck time, Planck, Planck, mm -hmm. uh, Planck space, right? Yeah. So it's, that's our best guess at what that resolution is right now. And, uh, you know... I don't know that that's really the case, but it's as close as you know, as close as we can come with our with uh, our science right now, saying that's probably what those delta x and delta t's are, and that is the place where our reality becomes granular. So, so see, there's just as you go through this, there's just so many paradoxes that just fall out as obvious. You know, they're not they're not hard to they're not hard to figure. So again, remind you, it's just a model. This is not Tom Campbell's belief in, the, in how the world is. It's a model. And if the model can explain things, then it's a good model. If the model can explain things, it's not a good model. Or if the model can only explain this part of it, not that part, sort of like, like classical relativity mechanics. Relativity or whatever. Yeah, or yeah. relativity or quantum mechanics. They only explain place of it. So that's, that's how you judge a model is about how much it can, you know, how much of the experimental evidence we have can be explained. And my model explains all the experimental evidence in both the objective world, the world you know, that we call our material world, and the subjective world. You know, it explains you know, how remote viewing works and how you know, mental healing works and how it is that mind can affect matter and how it is that there's such a thing as touch typing, that your intuition can actually process that data without you thinking about it. And there's, there's a lot of things that... that uh, that it just explains. And so far, and I have been looking, again, this is not what I believe. It's just the best model I could make up to fit mm -hmm. all the facts. I've been looking since I put this model out there for things that disagree with it. And so far, every time I found something that appears to disagree, I look at it a little bit and, oh, yeah, okay. That's how it works. And it just falls right out, like, you know, the speed of light being a constant. So that's, that's the way it, it, uh, it appears to work. You know, even chaos theory seems to fall out of the same, you know, the, the same understanding. So, so far, I haven't found things that can't be explained logically by this model. So that's why I say that uh, it's, it seems to be a good model. Now, do I believe that it'll always be able to explain everything? No, probably not. You know, that would be pretty, uh, that would be pretty, uh, uh, what, hubris, uh, pretty arrogant to think that, you know, what you know is going to be true for all time. Goodness, there's lots of things we're going to discover, you know, in the next decade, much less the next, you know, 100,000 years. It's hard to imagine how much our knowledge will increase by then. But I think it's a good model so far, it's a pretty it's a pretty good model, at least worth looking at. And if anybody mm -hmm. finds something that isn't easily explainable with the model, then I'll be the very first one that wants to, you know, wants to know about it. And maybe that means the model has to change, or maybe the model, uh, uh, you know, isn't. Uh, you have to look at the logic of the model. So I don't see my model as the truth and as perfection. I just see it as fitting. A theory. Yeah, I'm fitting data. And if it the more data it fits, then the better the model it is. So it's just that simple. Models have to grow and, and change. And all right. So that's have kind you of done a lot of work. Are. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask you a question about information too, but have you done a lot of work 
as far as like writing papers and everything to try to convince the scientific community that you're on the right track or, or, cause I know you have some experiments that have kind of been, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you have done those experiments uh, yet or not, but I know you've been trying to work toward like some concrete evidence to show the world that this is the right track to pursue. Yeah. Of course. So uh, you can't, you know, if you, if you talk to the physics community, you have to talk with experiments, you know, anything else is just conjecture. Experiments define truth and the rest is conjecture. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with conjecture. Con conjecture is always where you start. You know, that's how you get new paradigms is they start as conjecture and then you build evidence underneath of them. So, yes, I have a set of, of uh, quantum physics experiments that I made up. I delivered them first uh, in L.A., California in 2016. I had a, mm -hmm. I spent a day there just going over all these experiments. And they're just straightforward quantum physics experiments. And what they do is they create evidence. Now, I have to emphasize evidence. Science doesn't talk about proof. Science mm -hmm. used to talk about proof back in Newton's days. That's why we had Newton's laws. Well, mm -hmm. We don't talk about, you know, the law of quantum physics and the law of relativity because we learned a lesson. You know, you not you don't know everything <laughs> and the future is liable to tell you that you're wrong if you think you know mm -hmm. everything. So we talk about evidence, not, you know, absolute truth. Absolute truth will work its way out as future people you know discover more and more. So we have evidence. So I have these quantum thing, these quantum experiments. And yes, I am doing them. And I'm hopefully, you know, if everything goes great, we could maybe in a matter of a month or so have the first one done. And even if everything goes wrong, we're going to have them done, let's say, in six months mm -hmm. from now. So they are being done. And after we do the first one, the second one will come in, the third and fourth. There's five of them, basically. And okay. what they will do is create evidence that, one, this is a virtual reality. Again, another nail in that same... Uh, coffin of materialism that says that this reality is information based. Um, it will also say that it'll also produce evidence that this reality is computed. It's a virtual reality because we will be able to interact with the experiment in such a way as we change things, it changes things. Well, that's only possible if it isn't a machine, you know, if it is aware of what we're doing, and it changes, as we change, if we can kind of see that, then we see that there's something else. It's not just a machine that we're talking to, there's rules, and things yeah. that can change according to the way we change those rules. So you know, the like an algorithm. Slit, yeah, right. So the so the double slit did something that was kind of a minor miracle, it did something yeah. that was impossible, right? Single <laughs> particles going through slits one at a time, for no good reason, distributed themselves in an interference pattern. Mm -hmm. Whereas Newton would say that's impossible because they had no exterior forces on them to make them do anything other than just go in a straight line and hit the screen behind the slip. But they didn't do that. They distributed themselves in an interference pattern. So that's when we realized that you know, materialism really wasn't the right answer. It's a good answer, just like... Uh, Newtonian physics is a good answer, you know, in a certain mm -hmm. space. And materialism is a good answer in a certain space, but it's not the answer. There's something else going on there. So we have, we have, and I'll see, where was I going with that thought? So these, these experiments will do things like that. They do things that are, that are minor miracles, do things that are impossible. One of the miracles that they're going to do is that if you have a, a photon coming at what's called a beam splitter. Sometimes mm -hmm. they used to call these half silvered mirrors where right. the, the particle hits it and it has a 50, 50 chance of reflecting or transmitting. Well, that is random. It's just a random way that that light interacts with the, with the atoms and the molecules of that material. And right in my experiment, the experimenter will say the next photon is going to reflect. Now the next one after that, oh, that's going to reflect too. The next one is going to transmit, and he's, and he's going to be right. He's going to be able to predict what it's going to do. That would be incredible. 
yeah, to put another, that together another, like that. Well, that's that's a little miracle, just like the particles rearranging themselves into an interference pattern. And another mm -hmm. one I have is that <clears throat> you have a, a radioactive source, and we know radioactive source throws out particles. That's what radioactive means. It throws out stuff, right? So these mm -hmm. particles come flying out of it. And we know that it's absolutely random what direction they come out. They don't you know, always come out to the left or right or front or back. They come out any which way from a radioactive source. It's uniform. It's random. And in one experiment I have, you'll be able to say, the next radioactive uh, particle is going to come out on the left. And it'll come mm -hmm. out on the left. And the next one's going to come out on the right. And it'll come out on the right. In other words, they'll be able to predict how they come out, which is impossible because that's just a random function of yeah. how atoms decay. So these little minor miracles, just like the double slit was a minor miracle, are going to help create evidence for the fact that one, this is a virtual reality, or you can say it's a it's an information based virtual reality, it's a simulation, however you want to say it, and that consciousness is the computer. Because when, it has to do with consciousness changing things that makes the the system come out to one side or the other or to reflect or not reflect. So and anyway, that's what these experiments, if they work, you know, I'm a scientist, mm -hmm. I don't know that they're going to work. But yeah. I set them up to, you know, and see if they work, if they work, then they will add a couple of more pieces of evidence that we live in a virtual reality and that consciousness is the computer in that virtual reality. Now, it's not going to prove anything. Again, you don't get proof in science. You get evidence in science. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the experiments work. They all work to the best of your expectations. Mm -hmm. What do you think that will do to the scientific community? Will they try to write that off like they've written off uh, you know, similar experiments? Or do you think that could propel you to be like a leading scientist in the quantum mechanical field? What do you think will happen if those experiments uh, you know, work right? Well, I think in the beginning, they will probably be blown off because that's, you know, that's what happens. If you just look at the history of major paradigm shifts, the paradigm shift doesn't just happen on a dime. Like somebody says, oh, you know, it really works this way. And then everybody goes, oh, you're right. <laughs> it never works that way. You know, somebody says, you know, we've been looking at it wrong all along. It works this way. And everybody says, you're crazy. You know, so <laughs> sure, you're going to get pushed back. That's the way it is, you know. The world isn't flat, it's round. You know, you're an idiot. Of course it's flat. <laughs> if it was round, everybody would fall off on the other side. Right. You know? Um, anyhow, of course there's going to be pushback immediately. But as I said earlier, truth in science eventually floats to the top. And the reason that we have clung so stubbornly to a materialist viewpoint is because we don't have any other logical thing to replace it with. There is no logical thing. You know, the, the quantum physicists that created quantum physics, you know, I'm talking about, you know, Niels Bohr and Planck and Heisenberg yeah. and, you know, all those guys who created it, they were very excited about, wow, we've got something new. This is a breakthrough, a whole new view of reality. It's not mass at all. This is probability and it, it's telling us these big things. And we went from that kind of enthusiasm to nobody will ever know. It's impossible to tell. You know, it's just it's just a weird science. That's all. You know, that's called denial. You know, we got to the point we just denied it because nobody in the hundred years since since uh, you know Bohr and and Planck and those guys were excited about it. it's been a hundred years since they were excited. Nobody in that hundred years has ever said, well, here's an alternative. Here's how. Here's a logical model of how reality works. That's why physicists now won't say it's a virtual reality. They'll say it's an information-based reality. Well, what is an information-based reality? That means information is computed, right? It's computed reality. Computed reality means it's a simulation, which means it's a virtual reality. So when you say it's an information-based reality, the only rational conclusion that you can come to after you make that statement is that it's a virtual reality. But because they have no 
scientific, logical model that structures that in a way that it makes sense, then they're not going to say that. They're going to say it's a virtual reality because then they just make themselves look stupid. Oh, what do you think all this is? This matter? Look, eh, nothing in there, right? No, no brain unless you cut my head open. That's ridiculous. That's what they'll get. So they can't go there, but I will present them a model. So I think that, yes, push back. And eventually, those experiments will be repeated. They'll say, really, let me do that. We'll see if that works. And they'll get the same thing. And then they'll have to take it more seriously. And eventually, as time goes on, it will rise to the top. Because as of yet, there are no other competing answers. In other words, I'd, happy, I'd be happy with a different answer. <laughs> I just would like to have a model that explains things. Mm -hmm. And so far... This is the only model that can explain every all the facts we know now and a lot of the stuff we don't know settles the paradoxes. So I believe that it will probably grow. Now, maybe it'll be shown wrong. You know, my, mo my model is mostly metaphorical. The larger conscious mm -hmm. system is a metaphor for source. An individuated unit of consciousness is a metaphor for a piece of that larger consciousness system that can log on to a game. You know, it's... It's very metaphorical from my viewpoint because I, I just made up pieces everywhere my model and consciousness had a function that had to happen. I created a piece and gave it a name for that function. So mm -hmm. that's all my model is. It's something that I made up in order to create something that would explain the facts. So I don't claim that it's perfect, but it at least works and does explain all the facts better than the model we have now. So yes, I think eventually it'll be accepted. They'll say that, uh, wow, big breakthrough in the nature, you know, big paradigm shift. I mean, we've had big paradigm shifts before, flat earth to round earth. Earth is the center of the universe. The earth is not the center of the universe. It's just the piece of a solar system. And the solar system is not the center of the universe either, you know, and so on. We've We've had these paradigm shifts where we see things very differently. Back in the 1500s, the, it was known by the, the intelligence scientists, if we can call them scientists at that point, that the reason that the heavenly bodies went around the earth is that they were pushed by angels. Mm. And there's, there's any number of books that shows an angel up there, you know, pushing the moon across and pushing the stars yeah. across. And obviously... Obviously, it's only logical that the Earth is the center because we see all those things come up in the east and they set mm -hmm. in the west and they come up again in the east and set in the west. So it's only logical that they circle the Earth. And we know for a fact that nothing moves if you don't push it. If there's no force mm -hmm. pushing it, nothing moves. Well, these things are moving. So they must be pushed. Well, they mm -hmm. couldn't be pushed by us. So what could they be pushed by? Well, something must be some force that we don't understand and let's call it angels because the clergy like that <laughs> it's a good name so you see yeah. it, it was a very logical it seemed very rational at the time and to say to tell those people oh no no you know there's this invisible force that uh is at work called gravity what force you can say, well, you know, you can't tell them about space time. That's going to not work at all. So you say, well, yeah. look, masses, masses attract. All masses attract each other. And they say, well, here's a rock and here's a rock. I don't feel any attraction. Oh, it's so small that you can't tell. But it's moving all of these planets around, right? But it's so small that I yeah. can't tell. And it's a, it's a force that nobody can see or whatever. It's an invisible force doing all that. And I'll stick with my angels, you know, pushing yeah. this stuff around. That seems irrational. And the one other thing I would say is that because it's been 100 years since the first quantum physicists were enthusiastic about finding a whole new way of looking at reality, it's been 100 years with absolutely zero breakthrough. Quantum physics is still just called weird physics. They have no structure, no idea, no theory, no model that they can do anything other than materialism. They're stuck with that because it's the only thing that they know of. That's the last time they thought they understood what was going on was back in Newton's day. You know? Mm -hmm. So if it, if the paradigm <clears throat> shift wasn't massive, if the paradigm shift required to explain it wasn't really far out, wasn't absolutely insane and crazy, 
it would have been discovered in 100 years with a lot of very good minds working on it. So this paradigm shift is one that is from inside our present paradigm has to look absolutely ridiculous. If it didn't, it couldn't possibly be the truth. So any anything that is going to solve this mystery and, and solve all these, these paradoxes is going to have to be really wacky sounding, just like the round earth was wacky sounding, just like gravity is probably wacky sounding in its time. It's going to have to be really bizarre or it couldn't possibly be the truth. It was just a little smidgen. Oh, we've almost got it right. We just have to change just a little bit mm -hmm. and suddenly it'll become clear. No, we've had 100 years and we've gone nowhere, zero in 100 years. That tells me that if it isn't really, really strange, it couldn't possibly be true. So virtual reality, this is just an avatar. We're pieces mm -hmm. of consciousness, not physical bodies. That's strange enough to be true. I have a few questions on meditation that I want to ask you before we... Uh end this interview, but I, I do want to ask one more kind of scientific question. When it comes to information, um, I, I'm curious what you would be describing in the most primitive sense. If if we could scale all the way in to, you know, the, the smallest pixel that we can see of this reality, is that like a filament of consciousness or, or what is it there no. that's the, the bedrock Okay, let's reality. talk a little yeah, let's talk a little bit about information. Information yeah. is the bedrock. Consciousness is an information system. That's the that's the fundamental thing. Now, information is different than data. Mm. Okay, now we we tend to confuse that and we tend to use both words. We, we mean data, we say information and both, yeah. you know, so, so we we we're not very precise in the way we think about that. But we should be more precise because they're two very different things. Information is significance. It's the meaning. It's the content. So let's take a book. If you take a book, and a book is obviously a physical thing. So it's got physical paper and physical ink. Okay, now that's obviously just material stuff. Mm -hmm. That ink is not information. The words are not information. The ink words. The meaning of those words, the content of that book, the significance of that book, what that book tells you, that's information. The ink and the paper, well, the paper is the medium. The ink is the symbols, okay? That's data. That's data. Now, data can be moved. You can put it in a book, and you can send the book someplace else, and they can read it. You can put it on a, on a tape. You can put it on a, on a hard drive. That's data. On some hard drive, you need yeah. a consciousness for information. Information only exists in a consciousness. That book without a consciousness, without anybody to read it, is just data. Somebody reads it and says, Oh, look, it's a book about explaining how to catch fish or something. And they get it, they get the meaning and the significance of what to do. Then it becomes information. So the way we work, the way we interact is that. We can make, we consciousness can create information. So we've got this information. This is concepts, ideas, things we want to say. We have to convert that into data. Yeah. That data then comes out in the way we modulate our voice. That data comes out in the way we write with a pen. We create data. Now that data, we can move someplace else. Data can be transferred to another person. Now that other person, let's say somebody does that, you you have information, you write it with a pencil that puts it into data, which is handwriting in a particular language, which has all its own rules for that data. I get it. Now I have to look at that data and translate it into information. That's not an exact process. Now the process of taking the information is in your head and translate it into data is not an exact process. You may not have your language may not have all the words and the meanings and the and the you know the subtleties that you need to really get that idea across. You just do your best. So what you do has has uncertainty in it. I get that data with its uncertainty, and I have to interpret it based on my knowledge base, my fears, my knowledge, my ignorance, you know, my beliefs. So then I translate that data into information in my consciousness. 
you see? Now, that's flawed because my translation isn't going to be perfect because it was written in terms of your metaphors, and I got to translate it in terms of my metaphors. So there's, there's all this uncertainty in this process, but you see it goes from data can be moved to another. Now, what's in my consciousness, I can't transfer. I can't give to you. You can never know how I feel. I can tell you. I can describe it. But my description is not the same as my feeling. That's again, my description is data. What I feel, okay, that's, that's the content. That's me. So we have to separate those two. And information only exists in a consciousness and cannot be transferred you know, it has to be transferred in terms of information. So even mind to mind, if we have telepathic connection between, I put it in data language, some kind of logical form, I send it to you, you get it, and you have to interpret it. So even when it's mind to mind, what's in my mind just doesn't get planted into what's in your mind. It has to go through this process. So that's the big difference. So consciousness is the fundamental thing. Information only uh, only happens in consciousness. It's an information system. Consciousness deals in information. And you can only share data and then interpret information. Then you can create what you interpret. You can create more information and send it on to somebody else. But there's lots of uncertainties in that sending and transmitting. That's why you know, for example, men are from Mars and women are from Venus because we both interpret differently. Mm -hmm. Males and females have different interpretations of the same data. So anyway, that's to answer that question. That, that's a, a major understanding between the difference between information and, and, uh, and data. And I would tell your readers, if they're interested, I've got, if you go to my YouTube site. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got like a 1000 videos there. So it's like looking for a needle in a haystack if you're going through and looking for specific things. So I have two things that will help one for the science minded. If you click on the thing that says, um, um, what is that? Uh, what's the word where it's just, um, where you have a set of a, a set of things that you look at? Um, Playlist. Playlist, got it. Playlist. If you look at, if you click on playlist, then go to something that says science, science trilogy. And it's not just a trilogy anymore. It's got four or five things. And that's basically a distillation of MBT science, where I go through, where I try to explain people the science of MBT, as yeah. opposed to how it applies to the, to the, uh, you know, that's how it applies to the objective world, as opposed to the, the subjective part of it. So anyway, so there's a place for people to go. And the other thing that if you go to my website and go look at video, you'll find a tool in which you can put in a query and you'll get stuff back that will give you, mm -hmm. um, to, that'll search through those thousands of videos for the, for your, you know, for your subject. So you don't have to search yeah. for them. That's a pretty neat tool. I, I like that. Um, I, ha I just want to ask you one question about meditation before I kind of let you get the last word with the final question that I have for you. Uh, I'm at a point in my life now where I'm trying to grow in a lot of different ways. I have this book on writing things down. I'm journaling and everything. And I seem to be someone who is kind of maybe restless by nature, I think. And uh, the actual question I have for you here is meditation can be can cause discomfort. How does a beginner overcome that discomfort? What advice would you give to someone who has high anxiety levels and is a restless person? How can they good, get good at reaching a proper meditative state? And how can they involve, evolve in such a way as to be able to meditate like you do? Okay. Um, well, there's a whole bunch of questions in there, actually. Um, meditation does not have to be like classical meditation, you know, a mantra or, or fixing your attention on your breathing or looking at a mandala, or it doesn't have to be any of those kinds of things. Meditation is basically about just experiencing yourself, experiencing your own consciousness. 
And you know the meditation is really good when you stop experiencing your sense data. In other words, it's the same thing that happens when you read a good book. When you sit down and read a really good book, you don't realize that there's people walking down and there's traffic in the streets. It's all that just disappears. It's just you and what's going on in the book. And somebody could come up and, and tap you on the shoulder and you'd probably jump and, and you know get back in this reality. But you stop processing your sense data because you're involved in the book. Well, now this is the same thing. Meditation is like that, except there is no book. <laughs> there is no story. It's just you being by yourself, with yourself, to the point that you let all of your sense data go, that you no longer are paying attention to what you feel, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, what you see. So you close your eyes. Now you're not seeing so much. It's a little harder to close your ears, but a quiet place is usually better for, for people who are learning to meditate, you know, a place that has minimal amounts of sense data. You know, I guess the best place would be would be in one of those uh, immersion uh, sensory deprivation tanks. You know, it almost takes your, your sense data away as you float in one of those tanks. Well, that puts you into a good meditation state. So the meditation doesn't have to be some kind of classical thing that you do. And the problem with that is that sometimes people, people who are very logically oriented, they're logical process people. Sometimes they call those left brain people. They deal in the world with logical process, this, then this, then this, 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 therefore that, and their lives are run that way. Well, they will get into meditation with that intellect. All right, let's see, I got to close my eyes. Now I'm going to say my mantra. Now, you know, I got to say it clearly. I need to relax. And their intellect is all the time trying to explain to them what are they doing and judging how well am I doing it? Oh, am I doing it? Well, let's see. Do I feel this? Do I feel that? Um, you know, how many thoughts have come in and you put them away and they're constantly judging, constantly analyzing, constantly trying to follow the directions and all of that is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. That makes your meditation ineffective. Meditation is not an intellectual exercise. You've got to get your intellect to sit down and be quiet and let you meditate. So that's the whole point of meditation is getting out of your intellect into your intuition. That makes a successful meditation. So whether you do that with a mantra or with, with breath or listening to a particular piece of music or anything else is irrelevant. Those are all just techniques to help you get your intellect to sit down and be quiet. You know, the mantra just works by giving you non-operative fluff to fill your head with, you know, called mm -hmm. the mantra. You know, it's just some, some nonsense thing that you just keep turning around in your head which keeps your head busy. So it's not thinking of other things. So it's, it's uh, that's the trick fills your head with a non-operative sound. And then that lets you let go. So it, it doesn't matter really that you, you can just sit and be still. You don't have to do anything. Just try to not be analyzing, judging, assessing. Am I doing it right? Is this right? Is this wrong? How do I know that I'm really meditating all that stuff? is counterproductive. Just be with yourself and be quiet and let your mind be blank. Don't let it wander. Don't let it start figuring out, oh, what am I going to do tomorrow? And what do I have to know? I got to call so-and-so. And, you know, don't, don't go through all that. That's the intellect. Slicing and dicing and, you know, doing analysis. Just be empty. So work on that. Now, people who happen to be very anxious or happen to be, um, what, ADD or, or, Otherwise, on edge, going, need to be moving all the time, they'll have a little especially difficult problem. But they can learn to let their sense data go, just like anybody else. Just they through repetition? Harder, or Just through repetition. It may be, will take them longer because they have to settle down. But even a person that's ADD does settle down particularly if they're in a non-stimulating environment. So you have to find a very non-stimulating environment. And then you have to just let your mind just be with yourself. I am. You know, I call that point consciousness. When you become a point of consciousness floating in a void, then you have no sensory input and you're in the perfect Descartes moment of, you know, I am. That's all. Nothing else. 
nothing else going on. I just have an awareness that I exist. And when you're in that point consciousness, that's the best of all possible meditations. That's kind of the goal. But don't expect to get to the goal on day two. It may take a lot of practice. So get into an environment that is non-stimulating. And like everybody, the longer you're in that environment, the more bored you get. The more bored you get, the better. The more you just relax and let it be. Oh, I'm going to be here for 20 minutes. And then like, you know, like kids in the backseat of the car. Are we there yet? Yeah, is the 20 minutes up yet? The 20, you can ask that every 30 seconds. Are the 20 minutes up yet? 20 minutes up yet? You know, you need to just let that go. And just with practice, even if you tend to be an ADD kind of person, you can get to the point that you are not processing or minimizing the processing. And maybe that's as far as you can get. It's just to minimize the processing and make the processing things that are as non-operative as possible. Instead of trying to decide, you know, how you should change your pro portfolio of investments, you know, just like the mantra, just let a sound rattle around in your head or a chant, you know, something, some little phrase or something you're saying. It doesn't have to make, it's better if it doesn't make any sense. It's just something mm -hmm. to do. Do that. If you can't sit still, find something inoperative to do. Many people meditate while they do stuff that they do automatically, like ladies who knit. You know, when they sit there on the couch and they're knitting, that's a great meditation because their hands, like touch typing, just move all by themselves. They know what they're doing. They don't have to look at each stitch. If they do, then mm -hmm. they're not good at it yet. And they get good at it. It's just something they do. So you can find a meditation just while you're sanding wood, you know, because you're, 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 you're a, a, you like doing woodwork kind of thing. So just sanding a board can be a meditation. You're doing something, but it's not operative. You're not really thinking about it. You're just doing it. People who, uh, people do almost anything routinely to where it's a routine. They get to the point that they do it intuitively yeah. without thinking. I mean, how many times have you shown up in your driveway and then kind of blinked and said, how the hell did I get here? I don't remember driving home. You know, you, you just, your mind wasn't there, but you drove home just fine. When you're in the, when you are processing on the intuitive side, not the intellectual side, that's it. You're there. And it doesn't matter whether you're driving a car or sanding a board or saying, or doing nothing, just sitting still. That's the, that is a successful meditation. So if you can't sit still, then do something, but do something that's sufficiently boring and repetitive that it doesn't yeah. stimulate thoughts. You see? Yeah. Um, I know some people, I, 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 I plan on next week attending my first, I don't know, class at this meditation center. I just wanted to get some mm -hmm. instruction. But one of the things they do is they teach this walking meditation. And I almost thought that mm -hmm. that sounded dangerous to me because like, you know, if I could walk off a cliff or something with that. So <laughs> I, I just don't know if that, Maybe I'm well, just not thinking about it right. I don't no, know. No, when you do that, and and uh, that to me would be a little harder, but maybe it'd be easier for some people. I mean, some people have to move. You know, they, mm. they can't, if they sit still, they start getting antsy. You know, so for those people, then a walking meditation would be the right idea. If you can sit still, then it would probably be better to sit still. But what they're doing there, they're not going fully in the meditation state. They're splitting their mind. They are, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing a, a split. And they'll have 80% of their mind paying in the meditation, 20% of their mind making sure they don't step in a hole or, you know, walk, do something dangerous or run into people or, or walk off a, you know, walk off a cliff. So they just, they're, they're parallel processing. So they have part of them meditating and part of them not. And that's the way that's done. There's always a part of you that's aware of where your feet are going and where you are. Mm-hmm. But that part is just functioning at an automatic level. That's why you do it enough that it becomes automatic, that you don't have to think about it. If you have to think about it, that's counterproductive. Meditating is not thinking. It's not thinking the right thoughts. It's not thinking at all. It's just letting your mind be and just existing without doing. So you can't do things to meditate. That's counterproductive. You got to stop doing things to meditate unless you're so antsy 
that you want a parallel process and you can do things like sand the board or walk. And you do that without thinking about it. It has to be intuitive on the intuitive side. Because meditation, when you're in that point consciousness state, you're entirely in an intuitive state. Your intellect is non-operative at that point. You're just existing. I'm really looking forward to getting further into meditation to the point where I realize I've actually developed some minimal skill. I think that's going to mm -hmm. play out in some positive ways in my life. Everything from sleeping better at night uh, to just being more on track. But uh, it's something that I will stick with. Uh, Tom, I've got one more question for you. I appreciate you coming on. I was looking forward to it. You know, I enjoyed your book uh, and you will be back here uh, not too far into the future to talk with Bernardo Kastrup. Um, but I do want to ask you one question and let you take us out here. There are a lot of people out there that are, you know, searching for the truth. Maybe they're, um, you know, overcoming their materialistic uh, ways, but there's a lot of bad information out there. There are fraudulent people, people that want to take advantage of people with a message that they have. What would you say to someone out there that has, you know, read the books and they watch these videos and, and they're compelled to continue searching, but they're just not sure where the truth lies. Okay. I would tell them two things, two fundamental concepts so that if they keep in mind, they'll be all right. The first is if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. I've mentioned that already. So if it's not your truth, don't see that as a bad thing or that it's a problem other than the fact that you should maybe be thinking about how can I make that part of my experience? If, if that, you know, if the truth of that is something I'd like to discover, then you have to get, make a plan to how are you going to discover it? Okay. So if you, you know, learn that things don't always fit in a, I believe it, or I disbelieve it. Disbelieving it is another belief. You believe that you disbelieve it, you know? So mm -hmm. belief is the problem. Throw out your belief. Belief is a trap. It, it keeps you from seeing the bigger pictures. So believe nothing. The second thing is be open-minded. Let your mind open to all sorts of possibilities but also be skeptical. You must be skeptical of everything. And when I say everything, that's everything you hear, everything you see, you know, everything you smell and touch, everything, be skeptical of it. And the person you need to be most skeptical of is yourself. Mm. Okay, so you have to be Skeptical. Nobody can lead you down the la la path better than you can lead yourself down there. So you need to be skeptical. Everything. And if you have this mindset that things either have to be true or false, or true or not true, or you believe them, or you don't believe them, you can't do that. You can't be open minded. You can't be skeptical. All you do is jump to conclusions. And then you make that belief a fact in your mind. Matter of fact, that's what we think our belief, you know, that's what, our, you know, you ask somebody, well, what are your beliefs? And generally they won't have many beliefs. And that's because all of their beliefs they see as facts. They believe it, it becomes a fact. You see, so we hardly ever think of, I believe this. It's just a belief of mine. We say, oh, I know this. This is knowledge of mine. So you need to avoid that trap of the of the belief so you will always be skeptical so if you don't have the experience if you've never remote viewed if you've never you know healed somebody with your mind if you've never you know had a telepathic connection with somebody if you're not empathetic to where you can feel other people's feelings if you've never experienced any of that that's okay you just haven't experienced it but it doesn't mean that it's false because you haven't experienced it it just means you haven't experienced it so if you would, if you wonder whether it's true or false, then you're going to have to make a plan to experience it. There are lots of places you can go to learn how to remote view. You know, I teach courses and doing all those things, all those paranormal things. They're not hard to learn. Anybody can do them. What's hard is to be able to do them how you want, when you want, you know, and to be accurate and to be reliable. That takes a lot of practice, but just to do them, just to show yourself that it can be done, that's easy. 
It's not hard at all. So if you want to prove to yourself you can do those things, then you just take a course, you know, that uh, that teaches you how to do it. You know, I've got a course out there that's entirely, uh, you know, on your own. You just do it in your own time, in your own way. It's a, it's a, it's an at-home course if you if you like it. So, any case, those are the things I would tell a person. You know, you're growing. You're getting a lot of stuff. Yes, there's going to be all kinds of hustlers out there, all kinds of people trying to sell you whatever it is they've got. All sorts of pulls and tugs and pushes because we, you know, when, you, when you're not too grown up, you have ego and you have fear. And what we tend to do is manipulate others to be the way we want them, to take advantage of them, to get money out of their pocketbook, mm. to have them do the kind of things we you know we'd want them to do and we tend to do that so it's it's not just that that happens occasionally that's pretty endemic not always criminal or nasty you know sometimes it's it's not that it's it's much uh, more benign than that but it's everywhere so be skeptical you know i don't i'm probably the only lecturer who talks about my model and at the end you'll see if you listen to any of my my talks to people, you'll see at the end, I tell them, don't believe anything I've told you. If you believe it, that's not any big help to you. If all you do is believe it, that's what do you get? What do you gain by that? Very little. If you disbelieve it, you gain even less because now you won't even look at it. But don't believe it, experience it. Check it out with your own experience and keep things in a in a a measure of probability so instead of saying i must believe this or disbelieve it say well this is possible i've heard a lot about it a lot of people claim to do remote viewing and the cia did it for a while so i'll give it a 0.1 probability that it's real and not just some sort of scam 0.1 all right that's fine give it a 0.1 now find out about it read about it study it try to do it work on it. And that point one, if you succeed, will go up to point two to point five to point eight. If you don't, it'll go down, it'll go to point zero one, maybe point zero zero one. That's okay. It doesn't matter as long as you're open, you see, to finding out and experimenting and trying. As long as you don't get into a belief and say, I'm done. That's it. That's the answer. I'll never look at it again. That's a belief trap. So you should have on your little probability line, almost no ones and almost no zeros. Everything should be in the middle and should be in play, movable, something that can go up and down in probability based on your own experience. And if you don't ever try to get much experience, then most of those things will just always you know, have, you know, you won't make much progress with that. So another thing I typically say is that you have to learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. Many people can't live on live gracefully with uncertainty want to know. So they make something up, and then they believe it. And then they believe that they know and they're done. Hmm. And that happens on all sides. You know, there's, there's not just one set of people do that. Everybody tends to do that. So that's my, my thing to, to people will live gracefully with uncertainty, keep everything out there open minded, a possibility, even if it's a 0. 0.001. It's a possibility. Stay open minded. Put very Perfect. few things at zero. So that's the that's the idea. And if you do that, you'll always get to the you'll always grow, you'll always get to the right place. If you can always stay open-minded and skeptical and make sure that you don't take on somebody else's experience as your own fact. If you haven't experienced it, it's somebody else's fact, not yours.